Alhamdulillah, our brother is here, and inshallah, we shall start off by the recitation of the Holy Quran. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Malik Yawm اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المخلوق غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا الذي خلقك الذي خلقك فسواك فعدلك في أي صورة ما شاء ركبك كلا كلا بل تكذبون بيوم الدين وإن عليكم لحافظين كراما كاتبين يعلمون ما تفعلون صدق الله العظيم صدق الله العظيم جزاك الله الخير الاخ محمد يايا once again brothers and sisters i am humbled and honored to welcome you to the second session of the lecture tour of our brother the chief mufti from zimbabwe yesterday i had time to give a brief about him and I believe those who are here will remember what I said and those who followed also just to sum up our guest speaker 
Brother Mufti Ismail Musamenk travels the world with a message of peace and helping others in preparation for the hereafter. Yesterday, in his lecture on dealing with confusion, our brother identified three categories of chaos. One, chaos within our inner selves. Two, chaos within the Muslim themselves. And third, chaos of the non-Muslims' perception of the Muslims today. Among his nasiha on how we should deal with a confusion, I remember him concluding with the following words. Be of sound character, conduct, and also be patient. Today's topic within the theme of the fragrance that lingers is redefining our character. And that reminds me of the words of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The words that summed up the purpose and the objective of his mission when he said, That I was not sent except for the purpose of perfecting good behavior, good morals, and good character. Today is another opportunity for us to learn and be reminded by our brother on how we need to define ourselves. How do we need to brand ourselves as the true followers of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that ultimately, in his words, we are able to surrender and submit and through that we attain everlasting peace. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala once again accepts this gathering is a gathering of excellence and may his angels cover us with his wings and I pray that we be among those who listen to the good and follow it. Welcome brother Mufti Ismail Musamenk. Shukran. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inshallah, I will commence with the recitation of the Quran connected to this topic, inshallah. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Wa ibadur rahman alladheena yamshuna ala al-ardi hawnan wa idha khatabahum al-jahilun qalu wa idha khatabahum al-jahilun qalu salama wa alladheena yabituna li rabbihim sujjadan wa qiyama وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا اصْرِفْ عَنَّا عَذَابَ جَهَنَّمَ إِنَّ عَذَابَهَا كَانَ غَرَامًا إِنَّهَا سَاءَتْ مُسْتَقَرًّا وَمُقَامًا وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا أَنفَقُوا لَمْ يُسْرِفُوا وَلَمْ يَقْتُرُوا وَكَانَ بَيْنَ ذَلِكَ قَوَامًا وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَدْعُونَ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخَرٌ وَلَا يَقْتُلُونَ النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ ولا يزنون ومن يفعل ذلك يلقى أثاما يضاعف له العذاب يوم القيامة ويخلد فيه مهانا 
إلا من تاب وآمن وعمل عملا صالحا فأولئك يبدل الله سيئاتهم حسنات وكان الله غفورا رحيما ومن تاب وعمل صالحا فإنه يتوب إلى الله متابا والذين لا يشهدون الزور وإذا مروا باللغو مروا كراما والذين إذا ذكروا بآيات ربهم لم يخروا لم يخروا عليها صما وعميانا والذين يقولون ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين وجعلنا للمتقين إماما أولئك يجزون الغرفة بما صبروا ويلقون فيها تحية وسلاما خالدين فيها حسنت مستقرا ومقاما قل ما يعبأ بكم ربي لولا دعاؤكم فقد كذبتم فسوف يكون لزاما بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين We praise Allah سبحانه وتعالى A complete praise we thank him for everything that he has bestowed upon us. We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We send blessings and salutations upon all the messengers who came before him as well. From the very beginning, those whom Allah had chosen in order to deliver the message to mankind from him, we send blessings and salutations upon all of them. This would include from the very beginning, the great forefather of ours, Adam alayhi salatu wasalam, going all the way down, Abraham, Ibrahim, may peace be upon him, Ismail, may peace be upon him, Ishaq, may peace be upon him, Musa alayhi salam, Jesus, may peace be upon him, and all of those who were sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, including Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, all his companions, his entire household, may Allah bless them all, and may he bless every single one of us. Amin and our offspring to come up to the day of Qiyamah. May Allah bless them all. Say Ameen. That is a dua that may Allah bless you with a good spouse. Alhamdulillah. Because if you are going to say Ameen, may Allah bless you with the best of offspring, you first have to get a husband. Alhamdulillah. And then you have to get, inshallah, perhaps for those who are males, you have to get a wife. And then you have to have children. So it's a very powerful dua. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. My brothers and sisters, you and I know that the theme of this tour is fragrance that lingers. The idea is to leave behind something that smells good, something that would change our lives in a positive way. That's the idea. We don't want to come and go in a way that everyone says it was good, it was nice, but they have taken nothing from it. They haven't benefited in any way. To start with, I want to remind you, I read the verses of the Quran in front of you. Why? Why? Did I read these verses because this is a book of history that has no relevance in it? No. It is not a book of history that has no relevance in it. I know that some people perhaps have misquoted myself as well as saying, Oh, well, the Quran is a book of history. A'udhu billahi min thalik. May Allah safeguard us from that type of statement. The Quran is the word of Allah. It is valid ila qiyam is sa'a. Right up to the end of time, the book will remain valid. It has in it that which we need in our lives. It has in it a message for us. However, what we need to understand is the Sahaba radiallahu anhum have explained the three different types of verses in the Quran. I start off by explaining this. It says, or they have explained, some of them say it's a narration of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, but let's stick to that which is more valid and more correct. It's the explanation of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, wherein they state 
that this Quran has in it. It has in it. Listen carefully. Three types of things. I want to start with the last one that was mentioned for the benefit of everyone. It has in it verses that would decide and dictate the rules and regulations pertaining to our disputes. It has rules and regulations in it to be followed. So the Quran has rules and regulations in it to be followed. Those rules and regulations have conditions that need to be met in order to follow them correctly. You cannot just read a verse of the Quran. You've read the verse, it means establish salah and give your zakah. So you get up and you fulfill salah and you don't even have wudu. You're not even in the state of purity. You're not even facing the qibla. You don't even know what to read in the salah. No, you will fulfill the salah because the Quran instructs you to fulfill the salah. But you will make sure you know how to do it if the conditions are met, if you are in the state of purity, if you are facing the Qibla, if you have the timing of that Salah is in. I can't say the Quran says, read Salah. So now I read Salatul Asr, but it's five o'clock in the morning. I can't do that. I'm foolish. So what it means is when there are rules and regulations pertaining to your life, say for example, the Sharia, where it says that the penal code will penalize a person who has stolen. You cannot just go to anyone and start chopping off the hands to say the Quran says chop off hands. No, conditions need to be met. A situation needs to be present. Things need to be proven. When the conditions are all met, the rule will then apply. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. The same applies to the rules of jihad. Jihad means a struggle. It means to struggle to earn the pleasure of Allah. It also includes in it the struggle to defend yourself. If someone slaps you on your face, Islam teaches you to think about what type of reaction would be most appropriate for that particular condition. The Bible might teach you to give the other cheek. Someone slaps you on one cheek, the Bible says give the other cheek. The Quran says no, you think about what has just happened. That's what the Sharia teaches you. That's what Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam teaches you. It might be befitting to slap them back. It might be befitting not to slap them back. It might be befitting to wait for a while and see the reaction. It might be befitting to talk to them and engage in discussion. All this is part of Islam. It is all valid. It will happen in Islam. We need to understand conditions need to be met in order to fulfill verses of the Quran. I give you an example of jihad. People use the term jihad and what they say is that means just start killing everyone. Just start harming everyone. My brother, my sister, do you realize? Do you understand what it means? Yes, the verses are valid. We will not deny them. Never will we deny them. But what we do say is you need to make sure the conditions are met. You need to make sure that the situation would require for someone to participate in something that Allah has ordained. You need to make sure that it is actually valid from all different aspects and conditions. Understanding that the greater struggle, wallahi, is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Trust me, many of us seated here today, have not got up for Salatul Fajr today. It's a reality. Am I right? Am I right? Yes and no. Meaning, I'm not accusing people in particular. I'm raising a point. Many of us have got up for Salatul Fajr, but we would have preferred to have been continued sleeping. Do you agree? We would have preferred it. Hey, you know what? I got up because it's a duty. I didn't get up because it's an honor to convert yourself from understanding what is a duty and what is an honor is a line that you cross when you get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You read Salah because you consider it a duty. Yes, it is a duty, but over and above that, it's an honor. I want to worship Allah. I am fulfilling Salah not because I have to, but because I want to over and above me having to. So I'm not denying it is an obligation. But on top of that, I'm saying I'm so happy to fulfill it. I want to fulfill more than just the mere obligation. That itself is a struggle. Subhanallah. So my brothers and sisters, the Quran has verses in this beautiful book pertaining to talaq, pertaining to nikah, pertaining to inheritance. I cannot just impl implement those rules without ensuring that the conditions are met. I cannot come to a woman, look at her and say, I divorce you. Brother, you're not even married to her. Come on. You're not even married to her. 
So this is what we are saying. The same ruling applies to jihad. We are saying it is valid if the conditions are met and those are strict and stringent conditions because life, my beloved brothers and sisters, is absolutely sacred. You need to understand that. Allah says if you take away one life unjustly, it is as though you have destroyed entire humanity. من أجل ذلك كتبنا على بني إسرائيل أنه من قتل نفسا بغير نفس أو فساد في الأرض فكأنما قتل الناس جميعا I'm sure by now you've understood the verse, most of you. Where Allah says, we have written and Allah has written it. It's ordained for us as well as for those before us. Allah says, we wrote that if you were to kill one soul unjustly or to create chaos on earth, it is as though you have destroyed entire humanity. That's what Allah says. Every single life, singular life is sacred. That's what it is. Every singular life, just like you feel you have the right to live. Every single life was given by the same maker who made you has an equal right to live just like you have. Understand that. And the same rule applies when it comes to the opposite, which means if you were to save one life, the Quran says, وَمَنْ أَحْيَاهَا فَكَأَنَّمَا أَحْيَا النَّاسَ جَمِيعًا Whoever has saved one life, it's as though they have saved entire humanity. Remember that. So when you go out to save a life, is something sacred. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and help us through all our affairs. My brothers and sisters, that is the first type, or it's actually the third type, but I've mentioned it first, of the verses of the Quran. Then the same book has prophecies, prophecies of the future. The Quran has in it certain verses. It's not the whole Quran. It is certain verses where Allah speaks about what's going to happen in the future. Allahu Akbar. Do you know the meaning of it? If you don't, please go back. And look into it. I'm sure you know the surah off by heart. The bulk of you. Allah is describing the end. The day of judgment. How it's going to be. The day of resurrection. What's going to happen. These are prophecies. Where are they? In the same Quran. Subhanallah. Then there are verses. Without a doubt. Verses that have the most accurate records. Of what occurred in history. It does not convert the Quran into a history book. Not at all. Don't ever misquote, misinterpret people who are explaining to you what the Quran is all about. But it does have accurate counts, accounts of what happened in the past. <laughs> Remember the time when Ad belied the messengers. What's that? Allah is telling you the truth about Ad. There is a story, for example, a whole surah named after Maryam alayha salatu was salam, the mother of Isa alayhi salam. What does Allah say? The truth about Jesus, may peace be upon him. How he was born without the involvement of a male. Just like Allah has created Eve without the involvement of a female. And Adam without the involvement of male or female. And you and I with the involvement of both male and female. All this has been done by Allah. It's his power. Where does he make mention of it? In the Quran, Allah speaks about the accurate record of what happened when An Najashi in Abyssinia heard the verses being read by Ja'far ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu at the time of the migration to Abyssinia when the Muslims were being persecuted in Mecca. He began to cry and he said, This is the truth. Subhanallah. It's the truth about what? About what happened to Jesus, may peace be upon him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of so many other facts. That does not reduce this book to just a mere book of history. A'udhu Billah. That is an insult. That is something which is derogatory. It is unacceptable to say that. 
Notice how passionate I am when I'm talking. Because it's the word of Allah. That's why. And I have personally been misquoted regarding this word of Allah. So I've chosen to leave a fragrance of the word of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here in this beautiful city of Nairobi. That is the same book that governs what type of character we should have. When Aisha radiallahu anha, the wife of Muhammad, peace be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when she was asked, tell us about the character of this man, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Tell us about the character of your husband. Think about it, those who are married, male and female. If your wife was to be asked, tell us about the character of your husband, what would happen? What would she say? He comes late at night, he smokes so much, he's on guard whole day, and so on. They're chewing for seven, eight hours every day, doing things that are unacceptable, still justifying. No, there's nothing wrong with this. The ulama, there is a difference of opinion. Allahu Akbar. Everything there is a difference of opinion. Astaghfirullah. You don't hide behind difference of opinion to do something wrong. Smoking, smoking, people say, Allah, there is difference of opinion. It's just, it's makru, you know, makru. Okay, hang on. What's the difference of opinion? One might argue that someone says it's haram and someone says it's makru. I want to ask you today, personally, I believe it's prohibited. Wallahu a'lam, because it's harming your body. It is dangerous to your mind, your body, your health and everyone else. And you know, when you kiss your spouse, you don't want to know what type of a chimney she thinks she's kissing. May Allah forgive us. So it cannot be halal. It's no, it's haram, meaning we should stop it. May Allah help those who are perhaps involved in this habit to give it up. You'll save a lot of money. You'll be able to do better things with that cash. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all to eradicate our bad habits. We all may have bad habits, myself included. May Allah help us identify these habits. And that's the most important part of it, to identify, to be able to identify your bad habit. Wallahi is the first step to purify your character. To identify what's my bad habit. Sit and pause for a moment. What is my bad habit? Maybe my bad habit is I lie a lot. I talk a lot. I gossip a lot. I use WhatsApp a lot. I put too many pictures online a lot and whatever else. These are bad habits. You might think they're light. Wallahi, it's a bad habit. Work on it. Work on it, inshallah. So you want to become a person of better character? Admit your bad habits. Sit and think hard, hard. Be tough on yourself, but be lenient with others. Be tough on yourself. But be lenient with others. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. So I was saying if you were asked your spouse, you know, tell us about the character of your spouse. Wallahi, we would hear ajabul ujab. You know, the most strange things. This man snores all night. May Allah forgive us. Okay, let's not go to that extent. But at the same time, if you do snore, there is a way out of it. You just tilt yourself, follow the sunnah of sleeping on your right side, and inshallah, nine times out of ten, your snoring will go. It will go. Try it out. And don't send me an email saying, we tried it, it's still not working. <laughs> so, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. My brothers and sisters, think for yourself. If your spouse was asked about your character, what answer would they give? I tell you why. Because your spouse knows you better than everyone and anyone else. This guy's on his phone up to two o'clock in the morning and he's, he doesn't get up for Salatul Fajr as a result of that. And when I look at him, he's just on his phone. That's one thing. The men must be saying, no, talk about her. She's also on her phone till two. And she will tell you, well, that's because he's on his phone till two. And the argument continues. The idea is, Put your phone away. This is a bedroom. Put it on the side. If you want, you sit on a chair, be on your phone. And I've tried this myself. Sit on a chair, be on your phone for a few minutes. Put it aside. When you get into your bedding, it's you. And if you're married, alhamdulillah, your spouse, not your phone. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to understand we're not married to our phones, but rather we're married to people, human beings who need us to communicate and talk to them. The reason I say this is part of the topic. Wallahi, it's bad habit. It's bad character. We need to speak about these modern problems that we're facing. These are real issues. People's marriages are breaking because of the mobile phone. You know that. I know it too. People's marriages are breaking because of the type of gossip that is going on online. I know of a whole group of people who are divorced and their job is 
to go online and to speak bad about their ex. For what? Why? How come? How will it help you? No, I get closure. What closure? It's more of an opener. It opens the shaitan's door. Subhanallah. You want closure? Turn to Allah. He's the owner of that door. He will close it for you thoroughly and properly. Mashallah. He'll give you something better than you had. But if you continue mud slinging someone whom you've been intimate with and you've had children with perhaps mud slinging to the degree that they are derogatory comments are being passed. True or not? We're not worried. You're wasting your time. You're engaging in backbiting fadiha. You want to expose people whom you had in your nikah with the name of Allah. Why do you want to do that? You will not achieve anything besides becoming more and more depressed. May Allah forgive us. Remember whatever I've said, the verses I read before you state that whoever repents to Allah, Allah will forgive them. I haven't seen one verse or one hadith where it says whoever asks Allah's forgiveness, Allah will not forgive them. Have you ever come across that? If you ask Allah's forgiveness, Allah will not forgive you. Did you ever see that? Ever? Any hadith? Even a weak one? Even a fabricated one? No. It's not there. You ask Allah's forgiveness, He will forgive you because Islam is based on mercy. So improve your character. Seek the forgiveness of Allah. If anything we are mentioning today is found in my life or your lives, the way forward is to seek forgiveness. The way forward is not to lose hope. Oh, what did I do? That's it. I'm going to hell. Now it's over. That's not what I'm here for. I'm here to take you to heaven by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't own it. But the message I've come with is from its owner. Subhanallah. So if I adopt that message and you adopt it, Allah says, like the verses I read, those will be told they will be granted a special ghurfa, a special place in Jannah because of their sabr, because of their patience. This shows me that I am on earth in order to engage in sabr. My purpose on earth is to worship Allah alone. My purpose on earth is to pass the tests and the challenges that he puts in my life and he will put it in everybody's life. There's not a single soul that will not have challenges, difficulties, hardships and tests. Why? Because you are in this world to be tested. You are in this ground to be tested. That's why. Why am I struggling? Because Allah wants to see what you're going to do now that you're struggling. Why am I sick? Because Allah wants to see, are you going to go to those who believe in superstitious, superstitious solutions and they tell you to lift your right leg 90 degrees and, and put your left hand up and to start nodding your head 20 times with three lemons on the top of your head. If that's the case, you failed your test. There are other people with the same disease who made dua, they got medication, they did what was permissible in terms of ruqya, and they found a solution within one year, two years, they were cured sometime. May Allah cure us quicker than that. I mean. But those who want to find other solutions, you might be cured, but you, you failed your test. It's like cheating in an exam. You have the right answer, but you cheated, you disqualified. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. So my brothers and sisters, Allah says, you will get the ghurfa because of your sabr. And Allah says, what will you hear in paradise? They will only hear tahiyyatan wa salaman. They will only hear greetings, beauty, beautiful greetings and peace. The greeting of peace as well as the achievement of peace. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant that to us. So the point being raised, we will all be tested, my brothers and sisters. Learn to endure for the sake of Allah. Going back to what I was saying, you know, if you notice, I'm like opening new windows every little while. Talking about something, then going to something else, open a new window. Don't worry, I will come back and close each window, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help me to do that. So, I go back to what I was saying. Your spouse, the day your spouse can say, Wallahi, this man is a really good man. That's the day you are truly a good person. That's why the hadith says, khayrukum, khayrukum li ahlihi. The truly best from amongst you are those who are best to their spouses and family members. Best to them. We don't even talk to them. We walk into the house, we're upset because the tea in the morning was not as brown as we drink it. I don't talk to her for three days. Come on, make your own tea, please. <laughs> you know, it reminds me of a guy who got married and, you know, they... The girl who was getting married, generally back in my days, 
you know, a wife used to consider it an honor to make you a cup of tea. I think there are still a few who do that, alhamdulillah. <laughs> so generally, they would consider it an honor to make you a cup of tea, mashallah, you know. So the friends of this girl said, hey, 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 you know what, your husband, you better be careful. You don't want him controlling every aspect of your life, you know. So she says, what do I do? So her friends say, when something happens, in fact, it's the other way around. The husbands are taught sometimes to become harsh to the, to the wives. And this is something very, very bad. My beloved men out there, my brothers out there, you have to soften your approach. You have to soften your approach. You have to make sure you understand that the Prophet wasallam, who is not only better than us or a role model, but he's the best of creation chosen from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was the best. He was, his approach was unique. He made his spouse blush. He made his wives feel that they were truly most loved by him. Subhanallah. The way he used to do things was unique and amazing. So what we need to do, we need to also do that, which our spouses feel, Wallahi, I have the best man. And all of us here will be best men. Subhanallah. I've always been baffled about weddings when the man says, didn't you see me at that wedding? I was the best man. To me, the best man is supposed to be the groom. But no, it's other people on the side of the groom. It's true. The wife even says, Wallahi, those were best men, not you. May Allah forgive us. <laughs> May we become the best men in our own weddings. For some of us, it's a bit too late in the day. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. So my brothers and sisters, you've got to be the best because the difficulties we have outside the home, they, the root of it is inside the house. A man sometimes doesn't have a say in the house or a woman doesn't have a say in the house. It shows in her attitude, in her character, in her postings on social media at times. Subhanallah, it reminds me, my wife posted something on Facebook last week. And it was something she picked up from my quotations a few years back. And it, you know, Facebook keeps on reminding you to say last year, this time, this is what happened and so on. So sometimes you, you, you think about it and you might want to repost it. So she reposted a few things and they were connected to a marriage and perhaps how important it is to uh, continue and to work hard on it and so on. Wallahi, I, I received messages from people. Is everything okay? <laughs> my brother, my sister. I don't even know. Everything's okay. What's going on? Are you sure? Your wife seems to be posting things that indicate otherwise. I said, wow. A'udhu billah. Wallahi, I messaged her on WhatsApp. What did you post? She says, nothing. Just about three years ago, something that was there came on my timeline and I just shared it again. And I was shocked. I said, subhanallah, people are jumping to conclusions. You know, some would be happy to see a marriage break while others would be really upset. And some are just neutral, you know, but a lot of people are happy. Not because they are gaining something, but people will have something to talk about. That's why they are happy. We've become a community of gossipers. On the globe, people love gossip. The newspapers of today sell when they have gossip. Juicy news. That's what they call it. Juicy news. Allahu Akbar. Juicy. What juicy? Subhanallah. Cannot be like the pineapples of Mombasa that I've missed this time. I'm coming there, inshallah. We're coming there. May Allah make it easier, inshallah, if Allah wills. But my brothers and sisters, it's important for us to note this type of gossip destroys you. Not every status that people put up is connected to their lives, but sometimes it does show. Sometimes a frustration shows in the messages, in what you place online, because something's happening in the house, you cannot deal with it appropriately, you are venting by going online. Don't do that. Don't expose what's inside your doors outside. Not at all. It is not the character of a mu'min, of a believer. It's not the character. You leave it inside, your idea must be to resolve the matter. My beloved brothers and sisters, work hard to become good people such that firstly your spouse says, what a wonderful person. Say, I mean, even if you're not married, come on. At least it's a dua that you will get someone good like that, you know. Subhanallah. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, here comes the question to the spouse. What was his character? Notice I'm closing the next window. Okay. So Aisha radiallahu anha, what can she say? Because the, I, 
I have to say so much. There are so many nice things. You know, imagine someone asks about you and your spouse says, Wallahi, best person I've ever known. Lovely, really dedicated, a very good mother. I have absolutely no problem. She speaks well. And you know, the way that she chooses her words, very sweet, especially when it comes to me. She makes sure. So what do you do? You are claiming all of these claims. In fact, you are bearing witness, which is very rare today. You agree it's rare, right? I heard a few, yeah. They looked like they were disgruntled, mashallah. May Allah make it easy for you. So, it's rare. But you are praising them. Are you really trying to reciprocate it at least? I know of so many men, they tell you, I've got the best wife. But they go home and they are like, jabbarina fil ard, you know? They are like people who really, tyrants on earth. They go home and, hey, what's going on here? And so, but you just said your wife is the best. It shows that you need to change because according to her, you are one of those fara'ina, one of those fir'auns and she is just your asiya. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Don't let that happen. I don't want to enter the house where people have to run away. They must come towards the door. I will embrace them. Subhanallah. I will ensure that that embrace is not half-hearted. It's full and it can happen every day and a few times in the day. That's when you build the character of your own children. When your children see that you as parents are loving one another, you have moments of goodness that they witness. They begin to grow up realizing and understanding how to treat the opposite sex. But when they see the two of you screaming, yelling, fighting, shouting, whatever else, swearing and playing the Tom and Jerry, although you are adults, what happens to them? What happens to them? Wallahi, they grow up thinking that's how you should be treating a wife. Poor innocent daughter-in-law coming into a home, not realizing this boy is affected by the relationship between his mother and father. What happened to your character? Go as far back as that and check it out. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all. I'd love to hear good things about people. Whenever you speak about your daughter-in-law, in her absence, say the nice things. I'm sure there are a thousand good things. There's a lot of people say, ah, she's lazy. Lazy for what? She didn't marry your son to come and serve you. No, she's doing it as an honor. So say, no, mashallah, she's a really, really good person. So what if she doesn't get up early in the morning? The generation has changed. Nowadays, we get up at 10 o'clock, don't we? So long as I got up for Salatul Fajr, I'm set. After that, Salaamu Alaikum, I sleep better after Fajr than I did before that. It's a new generation. Wake up, smell the coffee. Not at 8 o'clock, but at 12 o'clock, perhaps. <laughs> My brothers and sisters, this is uniquely put. Wallahi, I tell you something. It is a very important message. I'm just wording it lightly. But the message is solid. The message is powerful. Learn to say good things about your mother-in-law, your father-in-law, those you live with. And when you have a problem, deal with it directly. I must deal with it here. Look, please, you know, I love you so much, but... This issue hurts me. No, you can't do that. You can't talk about it. Let's talk. When someone complains about you to yourself, don't become defensive. Otherwise, you won't be able to improve. When someone tells you something about yourself, correction, even if you think they are wrong, sometimes consider it strongly and say, thank you so much. Jazakumullah khair. I will take heed. Inshallah, I will try and improve this. And if you have a response, and it's your right to respond, especially if it's an allegation, Respond in a sweet way, in a beautiful way, lovely way. Subhanallah. You don't come up to be more cutting than the person talking to you because that is not the quality of a mu'min or a mu'mina, believing male or female. You need to have brilliant character. You need to speak back to those who cut you up in a way that you don't show them you are equal. You're not equal. You are one up. So the Prophet ﷺ's spouse, Aisha radiallahu anha, she just had one word. One word to say. Because there's too much. What can I say? Imagine if someone asks you, what, how's your husband? How's his character? And he's such a lovely person. You only say, the best. Is that enough? Wallahi, it's enough. Watch out. You better make sure they say, mashallah, tabarakallah, 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 about 20 times. Otherwise, you go home and he starts shouting and you don't know why. But people become envious. They become envious. And more important than mashallah is the term tabarakallah. Do you know that? Did you know that? 
More important than the term mashallah is tabarakallah. Because that is baraka, dua for baraka. So when you say mashallah, don't forget to add to it tabarakallah. Mashallah, tabarakallah. Get used to that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all ease. Aisha radiallahu anha says, Kana khuluquhu al-Quran. His character was the Quran. What a powerful response. So all this goodness he did, listen carefully, those who think the Quran promotes terrorism and violence, those who think the Quran is unjust, listen to this. Kana khuluquhu al-Quran. His character was the Quran, which means all the goodness that he did, the Quran taught him that. All the reaching out to the people that he did, the Quran taught him that. The dua he made for the people of Ta'if when they attacked him, a positive dua for guidance, was the Quran that taught him that. The everything was taken directly or indirectly from the Quran. He was a moving book, moving Quran. When you saw him, you remembered Allah. There are people in our midst, when you see them, you remember Allah. You want to do good. You want to become a better person. And there are people in our midst, when you see them, you want to go to the nightclubs with them. You want to start participating in evil with them. They are a bad influence. You start speaking in a vulgar way. Why? Your character is affected by those you associate with. Don't think you are very strong. Don't think I'm strong. I can be with dirty people who have filthy morals, bad behavior, people who call everyone else a kafir, kafir, kafir. I know of someone that I once met many years back. And he had this habit of just saying kafir to anyone, even a guy who's just moving without a beard, kafir. Why? He doesn't have a beard. Yeah, subhanallah. You removed someone, you know, you sent them to space just because they went over a speed hump, you know. That's not right. You can't do that. Yeah, wallah, kafir. Something, wallah, kafir. You took them out of the fold of Islam. Whereas as Muslimin, if there are 99 signs of a mu'min, sorry, the other way around, 99 signs that this person perhaps is sinful, and there is a sign that they are obedient to Allah, wallahi, you cannot remove them out of the fold of Islam just because of their sins. Not at all. You cannot remove a person out of the fold of Islam just because of their sins. Leave that to Allah. He has kept the day of judging. We all become very judgmental. That reduces our character to below what is acceptable. When you start judging, imagine this one, Jannah. This one, Nar. This one, Nar. This one, Nar. You know what that means? Fire, fire, fire. This one's going to hell. Going to hell. Yaqi, have you been to hell to see who was there? That's what I once said. I'm sure you were there before them because you're waiting there watching who's coming as well. You know? How do you know? I'd rather say Jannah, inshallah. I want to take the people to Jannah. We don't want to do them. I would be happier for more and more people coming into Jannah than to curse people and taking them to hell. Astaghfirullah. So be careful with these words. But when you associate with people like those, you become one. There just comes a time when instead of learning to love fellow human beings, in a way that even if they are wrong, you want to correct them. Rather than that, you no longer want to correct them. To you, they are in hell, it's over. I've got no obligation to them and it's done. What about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam? He worked so hard on people like Khalid ibn al-Walid ibn al-Mughira radiallahu an. That man was an enemy of Islam. He murdered so many Muslims. Wallahi, at one stage, he was an enemy. And what happened? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam called his brother al-Walid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu. In Medina, Al Walid ibn Al Walid ibn Al Mughira was a Muslim, radiallahu an, earlier than his brother Khalid. And the Prophet sallallahu asked him, "Where is Khalid?" Do you know what the Prophet sallallahu said? "Ma mithlu Khalid in yajhalu al Islam." A man with a brain of Khalid ibn Al Walid, so intelligent, such a genius. He cannot be ignorant of the fact that Islam is the true religion. Allah will bring him here. A few days later, he came in. Khalid ibn al Walid, long story, but the, the point being raised is look how the Prophet ﷺ was so concerned about enemies that he prayed for them. He said, I'm convinced this man is so intelligent. He will know that you cannot worship sticks and stones and idols and all this pagan life is actually unacceptable. True to the word, he came a few days later. 
If it was up to us, we would just say, Wallahi, kafir, kufr, don't mix with him, don't associate, don't have anything to do with him, kick him out, that's all. He's going to hell, he's already burning, the fire started here already. Hey, my brother, relax, take it easy. All these bad words, they are not good character. They are not equal to the character being promoted by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa They are something else. They have been contaminated by the devil in you. May Allah forgive us. Why? Because of the bad company that you're keeping. You associate with people who continue to, to think low of everyone besides themselves. You begin to become the same. I'm the only guy going to Jannah. That's it. In Jannah, it will be so broad. Paradise is going to be so big only for me. As for the rest of you, you will be on the other side. My brother, perhaps it's going to be the other way around. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. We need to change this. We need to change how we look at other people. Wallahi, as Muslimin, we desperately need to change it to bring it back to the original teachings of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa The concern he had to spread the goodness was such that a lot of it happened without him even talking. It was through his good character and conduct. Look at Abdullah ibn Salam radiallahu anhu. He was a Jewish rabbi in Medina Munawwara. He had hunted for Medina Munawwara and found it because in the previous Jewish scriptures, the description of the land where the final prophet was going to come was already there. He found it to be Medina Munawwara. So he shifted to that area. That was the reason why the Jews shifted towards Medina Munawwara. And when he heard there is a messenger that has arrived, he knew a few signs from his scriptures. Wallahi, he, he says himself that when I saw the messenger, peace be upon him. And how did he see him? There was a crowd of people around him. This man tiptoed in order to look, to see. He says, I saw his face, just his face. And I heard the first few words. When I saw his face, I knew immediately this is not the face of a liar. He's not a liar. This is not the face of a liar. And he said, Ayyuhannas. His first words, the first words that Abdullah ibn Salam heard from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa according to the bulk of the narrations, he says, I heard the messenger, peace be upon him, say, O oh people, ayyuhan nas, afshu salama, spread the salam. The salam is very deep. It refers to peace. It refers to the greeting. And this greeting is a dua. And this dua is actually a guarantee. What does that mean? When I say spread salam, say, your interpretation of it is spread assalamu alaikum. That's not a wrong interpretation. It's included in it. So how does it help us all? When I say assalamu alaikum, I am saying, may peace be upon you. What does that mean? I am praying to Allah. I am praying to my Lord that you are given peace. And that peace could be so many things. I am praying to Allah that there is nothing that opposes the term peace that comes to you, which means no war to you. That's what it means. No harm should come to you. These are the opposites of peace. So when I say assalamu alaikum, I mean I won't harm you. And I'm praying that nothing else harms you. Indirectly, that's what it means. I say peace be upon you. That means, hey, don't worry. I'm not here to hit you. I'm not here to harm you. I'm not here to call you bad names. I'm not here to start labeling you. I'm not here for all of that. I am here to say, may Allah give you some peace. And wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu, the mercy of Allah or the blessings of Allah and his mercy. Or his mercy and his blessings. I'm praying. So if you spread that correctly and you understand what you're saying, you will not be a hypocrite. You say, Salamu Alaikum, my sister. And as soon as she turns around, this woman, you know, she was a bad woman. You know, she, why? What character is this? If you really said, Salamu Alaikum, keep it that way. Someone says, hey, this sister, don't talk bad about her, please. If you have a problem, let's call her. Let's clear it out. Same applies to the males. You have a problem with someone, call him, clear it out. If it doesn't involve you, don't get involved. Unless you want to guide people in a sweet way, beautiful way. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. So Abdullah ibn Salam says, I heard him say, Ayyuhan nas, O people, afshu salama, spread the peace. These are characters of a good Muslim. Spread the salam. How many of us we don't greet? Let's be honest, we don't greet. We don't greet, wallahi. And if someone greets us, we don't reply. We don't reply, really we don't. 
Or if we reply, it's a half-hearted reply. Someone says, Salaamu Alaikum. Salaam. <laughs> Come on. It's an act of worship. You are getting 30 rewards for that long greeting. Greet back. وَإِذَا حُيِّيتُمْ بِتَحِيَّةٍ فَحَيُّوا بِأَحْسَنَ مِنْهَا أَوْ رُدُّوهَا إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ حَسِيبًا When you are greeted with a greeting, Allah instructs you to reply with a better greeting. That's what the Quran says. Or if you don't have a better greeting, then at least equate it. Why? Because the end of the verse says, Allah keeps account of everything. That's why. Allah took account. He greeted, you didn't reply. She greeted, you didn't respond. Or she greeted, you replied with a better greeting. Allah says, Allah kulli shayin hasiban. Hisab is taken. We took it. We know it was part of your test. With us, we don't even want to greet. We don't even want to reply. Why? Just because maybe, I'm giving you a typical example. Maybe the sister's hair is not covered. So what happened? I don't greet. Khalas. Why? Not on my league. Not on your league. Maybe your heart is naked. May Allah forgive us. Maybe you are involved in pornographic addiction. Possible. Then what league are you on? Be careful. Be careful. I'm speaking of reality. Maybe you are silently committing adultery. Fornication. Maybe you are involved in something dirty, really filthy. And you just said, I won't greet. Come on, come on. You don't know who is closer to Allah. Greet them, let them greet you back. You received the dua from a pious sister. You received the dua from a pious brother. Greet them, they greet you back. You got the dua, you went away. Your day was good because someone said, Assalamu alaikum to you. That's why you had a good day. Because they made dua for peace for you. And you didn't even bother to reply. Do you see our character, where we are failing? Something simple. Abdullah ibn Salam, Jewish rabbi, he heard these words. Spread the salam. I hope I've given you a new perspective of salam. Say it and respond. Respond nicely with a smile. Break into a smile. Because when you respond with a smile, it's a better response. As Allah says, we take account. This person greeted with assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Now when they say that, there's not much to beat them in. I cannot really compete. But I can compete with one thing. What is it? I can add a smile to it. By the way, my name is Ismail. So, to be honest, <laughs> you said wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And you smiled a little bit. They felt good and went away. Duas, two duas received supplication for one another. These are people who really probably didn't even know each other. And they went away. I had a lovely day. I had a beautiful peace for the rest of the month, for the rest of the year, maybe for the rest of my life. Maybe I was saved from something harmful because of that dua. And I went away. Ayyuhannas, afshu salama. The second part of that narration. Wa at'imu ta'ama. And feed the food. That's the second part of? The same hadith of Abdullah ibn Salam. He says, I tiptoed. I saw his face. It wasn't a face of a liar. First thing he said, oh people, spread the salam and feed the food. This is the first part of it. Second part of it. What is me the meaning of feed the food? Learn to share what you have with others. Whether it's your family members, whether it is people who are related to you, or those who are not related to you, or anyone in need. I can invite to my house even those who are not in need. Sometimes invite those who are in need as well. And I can reach out to those who are not in need as well. But be kind to those who are in need as well. When you see a poor person, don't look at it as a burden. I was disciplined by my own mother. You know, back at home, we have this habit. Obviously, we don't like it. We want to see a solution. But only Allah knows the need of that person. As for the one who's begging or asking you, don't rebuke them. You give them, give them. You don't want to give them, respectfully don't give them. Respectfully. My brother, may Allah bless you. Barakallah feek. You know what? I won't be able to give you anything today, but Allah bless you. I give you a dua. And you carry on. Instead of saying, you, you're coming to beg here every day. You're making a bad, you know, you're setting a bad precedent. You're giving a bad image of Muslims and Islam. Relax. Allah says, Don't rebuke these beggars. 
You don't want to give. Yes, you may not. If there is a reason not to. But the minimum is you give them your good character. That is better than giving them lip. Allahu Akbar. A lot of the beggars, if you rebuke them, even if you give them 100 shillings, they might give it back to you because of your attitude. Personally, I don't want a favor from someone who has an attitude. I'd rather not have that favor, no matter what it was. May Allah forgive me and forgive all of us. What do we like? Wallahi, what is more valuable than money is character. I want to share with others the good nature that would make life a pleasure to live. And it would be an honor to worship Allah in such a way that I, my mind is at peace because the character of the people around me is so beautiful. I've got no worries. But imagine you go for salah. This guy here, you owe him money. That guy there, he's swearing you. The other guy there, you've had a problem with him. The person at the back, they want to hit you. How are you going to read salah? You say, Allahu Akbar, and you're busy shaking, looking this way here, looking that way there, seeing this, checking if any money's gone from your pockets, watching your mobile phone. Why? When I say Allahu Akbar and I start my prayer, I want to be able to concentrate properly. How will that happen? Develop your character, your conduct, purify yourself. You understand? You, I, have no, I have no issues with people. If they have issues with me, wallahi, it's up to them. As for me, I have no issues with them. I've tried my best. I've fulfilled my duty as a Muslim and I did it with respect, with a smile. So what happens? I was telling about my mother correcting me. You know, we have this habit of beggars coming to the gate. Ding, ding. They ring the bell. And especially on a Friday, they come and they, literally they say, one beggar. That's how they word it in our own local language. Okay. So it means something. So myself, young man, obviously, subhanAllah, I feel these are men. They have their limbs and everything in order. They are healthy. They just need to work a little bit and inshallah they will earn. So why are they begging? You know what my mother says? Give them. I said, are you going to carry on? For as long as I am alive, give them. Even if it is one piece of bread. Did you hear that? And I'm like, but you are, you know the new mind, how it thinks. But you're encouraging this behavior. You are going to get a whole mom. Let me tell you, tomorrow morning there's going to be, a, and wallahi it happens, huh? there's going to be 20 people standing there. And they're all going to, she said, so I'll buy two loaves of bread and give them a slice each. What's wrong? What went from yours? Did anything go? But you know, it's a security hazard. She said, since when is it a security hazard? What happened? These people are walking on the street. I'm talking of my own mother. I changed the way I look at it solely because I was corrected. And I said, you know, when I drive out, sometimes I'm driving out of the gate and I see these people standing at the gate. And what happens? I just look at them, salam alaikum, I walk away. I said, don't worry, my mother will send something for you just now. <laughs> it's a reality. I learned why. That is character, sharing something. What, what went of yours by buying a loaf of bread, two loaves of bread? What went of yours? You might have some who might not want the bread. They say, hey, look, I don't want, I want money. You say, look, that's what I have. Then you can actually step in. Yeah. I'm not encouraging the giving or not the giving. I'm just telling you to look at it from a different angle. Sometimes if it is really dangerous and in your circumstance, your situation, your nation, it is something that should not be happening because of the danger that comes with it. I cannot judge your situation. It's up to you. But I can just encourage you to say, look how I learned. Okay, that's all. Subhanallah. Feed the food. Feed people. Feed those who don't have food. The hadith is telling you to do that. A person, sometimes we who live in the cities are lazy to go out to the rural areas to see the people there and how they are living. And sometimes we are lazy to go out to look for those who are poor. So Allah sent them to our doorstep and still we said, why are you begging at my gate? Get out. Allahu Akbar. Allah says, feed the food. Imagine a beggar tells you, okay, eat all your food, don't give me, eat it, eat it, all of it, and get sick. Some people are dying because of them eating too much. Wallahi, it's true. You look at everything in front of you, there's a limit to it. I know cheesecakes taste nice, but I also know they're not so healthy. So imagine things that look nice and taste nice, mostly are not really too healthy. Have you ever thought of it? 
Why? Because I think it's a lesson for me to know that you don't judge a book by its cover. You see someone, I will not judge you on your makeup because I know that it was Mac that came into the scene, not you. <laughs> I, want to, I want to interact with real human beings and be able to see their contribution, their dedication, their character, their conduct, and so on. That is what is the value of the person in the eyes of a mu'min. That is more than what they look like. And I learned that from just looking at food. I see lovely things and they taste really nice. I've got to control myself. Because inside, it's bad for you, bad for you, you know. They say a lot of the times, I'm, I'm going to say this because I've heard it in the past and I've even said it in the past. They say a lot of the times, a guy sees a girl and he says, wow, will you marry me? And she says, hmm. <laughs> she looks to the side, she sees a wonderful Ferrari. She says, yes, I'll marry you. <laughs> yes. What happened? The hadith says you look at akhlaq, you look at the deen, you look at so many things. I looked at looks and she looked at my Ferrari. That's all. And by the way, I do come from Harare. <laughs> so anyway, she looked at it. She wants to marry me. I want to marry her. Guess what? Guess what? She makes a beautiful trophy, but not a wife. You know what a trophy means? You walk with her arm in arm. You go through the mall, the dunya will take photos of you, put them up on Instagram. Ideal couple, ideal couple. A year, two years later, you hear about the split up. I don't need to take names, but anyway, they are there. You hear, why? Because now there's no more a Ferrari. Or for example, you no longer live in Harare. <laughs> Things have changed. Had I based it on something real, you grew older. I became deeper in love with you. I've seen what you're worth. You are my backbone. You are my strength. And I am yours, subhanallah. I support you. I'm dedicated towards you. I love you. I will make sure that you are a person who I want to go to paradise with. That's the value. I didn't, I didn't base my decision to marry on something material, something cosmetic. No, cosmetics will change day to day. In fact, you, it will, a reality that will come up might be something shocking. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. The point here, I'm deriving it from at'imu ta'ama. Share what you have with people. Develop yourself. Become of good character. You have character, share it. You have goodness, share it. You have an expertise, share it. You are a doctor. Set aside a few patients whom you check for free. Subhanallah, for the sake of Allah. Without making a show of it. Without making a show of it. I sponsored this. I did this. I don't need my name or my logo. No, I did it for the sake of Allah. And that's it. Subhanallah, what are you doing? You're sharing. Sharing what? Even knowledge. Share it. Forward good messages. When we see a dirty joke, dirty joke, we forward it. When we see a laugh, we forward it. But when we see a serious message, do we forward it? Some might say, yes, we do. Well, alhamdulillah, good news to you. Get used to spreading that which is good and great. Last night, someone sent me a message. I want to share it with you, okay? Or was it yesterday in the morning? So, you know WhatsApp? I'm sure everyone knows what WhatsApp is, right? WhatsApp has in it emoticons. You know what are emoticons? These little men and women and faces and smiles and close your whatever else and so on and the heart. And that's the same heart that we once spoke about in a lecture. I think it was in Singapore when I spoke about how it blows up now and boom, boom, it starts pumping. You can actually see it, you know. And we still send it, send it to the wrong person. But anyway, so what happens is if you take a look at the cars, they're all moving in one direction. All the cars are facing one direction. I didn't make WhatsApp, so don't blame me, okay? All the people heading in this direction, all the animals heading from right to left, all of them heading from right to left. The animals, go and check it out. The fish, check it out. The men and all the people, check it out. Facing, they, are, they are facing this direction. So from the left towards the right. There's only one species that is going from the right to the left. Should I leave it to you or should I tell you now? The woman. <laughs> Wallahi, she's facing the other direction. Check it out. I'm not lying to you. Wallahi al-Azim. Open your WhatsApp and check what I'm saying. All, everyone's facing one direction. They're all facing from the left going to the right. And the, only the woman with the red sari is facing the other way. <laughs> Subhanallah. She's facing the other way and she's happy about it. 
Allahu Akbar. Have you seen that? Astaghfirullah. So anyway, I sent that to my daughters. And the caption maybe, you know, was a little bit feminist and so on, or perhaps it was sexist, however you want to word it. But it was just an observation. People observed it. I think WhatsApp's going to have to change it because, you know, women are going to make a noise about it. But some intelligent women, I sent it to my daughters. So subhanAllah, my daughter, she sends me back a message. She says, what do you see? What do you see? I see the whole world. Listen to this. I see the whole world, everyone going in the wrong direction. Only the woman is going towards the right. <laughs> Subhanallah. So it all depends on how you look at it, right? Some will be offended. Some will make a joke out of it. It's just an observation. But look at this. Subhanallah. You're actually walking in the right direction for once. Uh oh, I shouldn't even have said that. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. But don't be offended. We are, we are raising something. Your value is definitely based on the direction you are walking in, not what you look like externally. Remember this. Now, to, to purify my character and to redefine my own character, I need to start looking at people from this angle. A lot of us say, stop judging me based on my looks. Correct. But you stop judging others based on their looks. That's what I'm saying. Subhanallah. And this is one of the reasons why Islam has taught us to cover. Cover properly. Why? So people must not judge you based on what, your, what the shape of your body is, based on the weight and so on. People are depressed. I was reading an article on BBC some time back, and it said there that in Britain, the amount of depressed cases in the girls from the age of nine, because they are not happy with what they look like, they are not happy with their looks, with what they are like. Because of that, so many people, Girls are depressed. They need to live up to a certain standard. The largest industry in the world is the makeup industry. Did you know that? Why? Because you've got billions of people. All of them have makeup. Subhanallah. Including a lot of the men nowadays. Allah make it easy. See, the men didn't find that funny because they're guilty. <laughs> the hadith continues. أَطْعِمُ الطَّعَامَ وَصِلُ الْأَرْحَامَ Go and fulfill your family ties. Go and, subhanallah, connect with your family. Connect with family members. Now, my brothers and sisters, that is a problem today. A lot of people don't want to connect with family. But why? Go to the reason. Do you know why? Sometimes family makes it difficult for them to connect. As soon as you see me, you say, hey, come on, what's with the haircut? Develop a relationship with me first. You know, talk to me nicely. You can come to the haircut. I'm not saying don't talk about it. It's your duty as a Muslim. But you first need to make sure you have watered this whole area and then you will sow the seed. But I don't even know you. I say, your haircut. I won't come back to your house. Why won't I come back to your house? You're picking on me. Every time I come, there's something wrong. I'm going to hear another lecture. As soon as I pass your house, I can already start hearing your voice in my ears because I know, hey, when I go in, this auntie of mine is just going to start picking on me. Hey, when are you getting married? When are you starting a family? When are you having kids? Hey, mind your business, mom. <laughs> You're my aunt, I know, but relax. You got someone for me to marry? Talk. But stop it. Don't make it difficult for people to maintain that relation. Notice the angle I discussed it today from is different. Normally, people say, go and maintain family ties. I am telling you, yes, that is correct. But I want to say, make it easy for others to maintain ties with you. By becoming a good person, simple person, develop your character. We're redefining it. We're going now to the people who are expecting others to come to them. Why are they not coming to you? Why do your grandchildren don't want to greet you? Because every time they come, you expect them to be adults and they're only three years old. Sit, sit quietly. Hey, mom, don't talk to my kids like that. You know why? They're not going to come here. They are kids. They cannot sit quietly. Okay, give them a glass. Let them break the glass. Relax. That also is the other extreme. We want you to be a balanced person. Come on. We love you. We want some of the little children don't want to greet the grand. Sorry, I'm just giving you an example. It's not necessary that it happening in, it's happening in your case. Some of them don't want to greet. Why? They're kids, innocent kids. You did something. That's why. You did something. 
and stop for goodness sake giving them sweets every time you see them because if you want to give them sweets and chocolates please throw in a bottle of benilin with that cough mixture allahu akbar i hope you understood what i said they're going to suffer you don't have to give them sweets to win them over it's a way of bribing that's bribery and you know bribery is not allowed in islam right look at how how deep i'm going what i mean is Greet them nicely, show some love to them, hug them. Don't pick on anything and everything. You will guide them, but in a beautiful way. And remember, they are little kids. So you need to ask yourself this hadith which says, Wasilul Arhama, am I a person facilitating it or making it hard for people to mix with me? On grounds of principle, sometimes you might want to make it a little bit tough. For example, there are people on drugs or who have terribly bad habits. I don't really want to associate with them deeply. In that case, you have every right to distance in a beautiful way, bearing in mind the minimum. What is the minimum? Salaamu Alaikum, Wa Alaikum as -salam. How are you doing? I'm fine. Stops there. Why? Because I want to protect myself and my family from the evil of this person, even though he's my brother. For example, if he's on drugs, if he has a bad habit, if he is committing adultery openly and he's bringing the person who he commits adultery with into my home. Hey, hey, hey look, I've got a few principles in my house. Salaamu alaikum as -salam, what, what? There we are. I'll meet you at the masjid, inshallah. Yeah, that, that's okay. You have a reason for it. But, wahjurhum hajran jamila. The verses I read before you stated, إِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا When the ignorant greet, or when the ignorant communicate you just say peace and you walk away you say a statement but it is a statement of peace not a statement of war because people who are ignorant when you want to say anything more they will misinterpret it the best thing say a good word of peace walk away never mind if they say this person doesn't talk much no problem that's my nature I'm selective you have to be selective but remember you need to be an easier going person than you are right now myself included when I say easy going, I don't mean compromise your deen. No. I don't mean compromise your values. No. I don't mean compromise your morals. No. I mean be a little bit more easy going. Like I said earlier, be hard on yourself, but be lenient with others. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us refine our character. So he says, Silul Arhama. The hadith says, Laysa al wasilu bil mukafi. إِنَّمَا الْوَاصِلُ الَّذِي مَنْ إِذَا قُطِعَ رَحِمُهُ وَصَلَهَا A person who maintains family ties is not the one who has a tit-for-tat relation. You do good, I do good. You invited me, I invited you. You made biryani, I made biryani. No. A true maintainer of family ties is the one whom, when it is broken from one end, they make an effort to mend it. Those are the ones. They make an effort to mend a broken relationship. Brothers are not talking to each other. Over what? Over money, neither of them are going to use. Why? Father died, for example. We've got a few million sitting here. I don't talk to him. He doesn't talk to me. My brother, in your life, you're not going to use more than X amount. You're fighting now for an amount? Give it. Adopt what is right. Do what is correct. Do the honorable thing. Maintain the ties. Don't let your ties be broken because of a small amount of cash. A little misunderstanding be the bigger one no problem my brother it's okay I love you you are my brother I will maintain the tie because I love Allah enough to do something that will earn me paradise it will earn me paradise it's not easy all these things mentioned in the hadith they are not easy they are tough we just read them read the hadith and think okay it's all okay it's hard to maintain ties or to go and mend a broken relationship is tough because you need to put your pride down and you need to go in and sometimes apologize where you feel perhaps I wasn't totally wrong. I'm not saying apologize if some of your rights are usurped to the degree that you're oppressed. No, you don't have to. You can, you can literally fight for your rights in a proper way. Maybe I shouldn't use the word fight, but I should use the word you can actually go and ask for your rights or claim them or get them in a beautiful way, in the correct way. But what I am saying is where it is resolvable. It's solvable. It's something minor. Go and resolve it. You will earn Jannah as a result. Do you know why? When a problem is left, it seeps down to the next generation. Very quickly. 
When it goes to the next generation, it goes to the third generation. At that juncture, what would happen? Families are totally broken without realizing why. Why are we not talking to our cousins? Don't, I don't want you to talk to your cousin. Why? Because our grandfather had a problem with their grandfather. Oh, come on, man, relax. The grandfathers are both gone into their graves and it's already all sorted. You don't need to do that. Be the bigger person. You have a problem with someone, try not to involve the kids in it. Try not to. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. These are real problems we face in our families. So he says, Silul Arhama. Afshus Salama, wa atimut ta'ama, wa silul arhama, wa sallu bil layli wa nasu niyam. And fulfill prayer at night when all the people are fast asleep. Wow. That's the last part of that hadith. Fulfill the prayer at night when all the people are asleep. And what will happen? Tadkhulu jannata rabbikum bi salam. You will enter the paradise of your Lord with peace. You adopt these four things. As-salam, at-ta'am, al-arham, and as-salaa wa nasu niyam. Tadkhulu jannata rabbikum bi salam. You will then enter the paradise of your Lord with peace, with ease. Because I fulfilled all of these things. Abdullah ibn Salam says, when I heard this, immediately I knew this is a prophet of Allah. This is a messenger of Allah. He's come with a message that's not pulling towards him. It's pulling towards Allah. He's come with a message of goodness, sound morals, sound character. Beautiful conduct, something short words, very, very concise words with deep, deep meanings. It is known as Jawami al Kalim. The Prophet says, U'titu Jawami al Kalim. I have been given the miracle of very few words which have very deep meanings, such as this hadith. Amazing. We say, He is our Prophet. He is our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's an honor to be part of the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Do we really emulate his character, his conduct? Do we really follow it? That last bit of the hadith which speaks about reading voluntary prayer at night when everyone is asleep, cry to your maker. You will achieve peace through that. Sometimes we don't pray. So what does Allah do? He loves us too much, too much. So he inflicts us with something we consider negative. But it was the most positive thing. You suddenly discovered your Lord. I didn't have a link with Allah. I had no connection with my maker. But suddenly I became sick. When I became sick, I ran from this hospital to that one. They did not know what was wrong with me. What, what could I do? I raised my hands in supplication for the first time in my life. Oh Allah. I will change my bad ways, my habits. Oh Allah, cure me. And Allah says, look at how beautiful you are. Look at how lovely your heart is cleaned. Look at how softened your heart is. Look at how you've come to us. We want to keep you in this condition for a slightly longer while. Because we love how dedicated you are to us when you are in this condition. Was it a mercy? It was a mercy. Was it a punishment? No, it wasn't. It was a gift. So don't think every time something negative happens, it's a punishment. No, it's a gift of Allah sometimes. When you have too much in terms of the world, you forget your maker. A lot of the people that happens to them. Shaitan comes to make you think, okay, by the way, I've got the money, I've got the looks, I've got the health, I've got the wealth, I've got the family, I've got everything set and going. What do we do? Let's go for a holiday. Where? Somewhere. We've gone on the holiday. That's not wrong. So far, it's not wrong. But when we were on holiday, no salah, no halal food, no nothing. We started clubbing, we started drinking, everyone started dancing, and suddenly, boom, something went wrong. What happened? You realized, hey, I went a little bit too far away from Allah. So you go back, you say, oh Allah, what has happened to me? Oh Allah, forgive me. Oh Allah, my way. Allah says, well, we love you. That's why we brought you back while you are alive. We brought you back to us. Every one of us, without exception, we have needs. Understand, the one who fulfills those needs is Allah, your maker. Develop humbleness, develop humility. 
I want to share something with you about how to reach out to other human beings. It's a hadith I'm sure a lot of us would know. I've said it before. I repeat it because وَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ الذِّكْرَ تَنْفَعُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Remind for the reminding would benefit the believers. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, made mention of a man who was in the desert and he was very, very thirsty. So he was looking for a well. He found a well and he didn't have a container now to go and get water from the well. So he took out his shoe and he went down the well. He filled it with water. He drank. He came up. When he came up, he saw something. What did he see? It was about to change his life. What he saw was life changing. Guess what it was? Someone might say, oh, he must have seen a pretty lady, changed his life, he got married happily, happily ever after. No. Oh, he must have seen two angels. No. What must he have seen? He saw a dog. He saw a dog. Panting. Panting out of what? Thirst. فَإِذَا كَلْبٌ يَأْكُلُ الثَّرَى مِنَ الْعَطَشِ فَإِذَا كَلْبٌ يَلْهَثْ يَأْكُلُ الثَّرَى مِنَ الْعَطَشِ Suddenly he saw this dog panting and it was trying to dig into the ground out of thirst, the sand. So what did the man say? Life-changing, life-changing. You and I know that this hadith is valid, it's correct, it's authentic, there's no dispute about it, okay? And I want to share with you something else. It could have been a bird. A bird is a more noble animal than, or a bird is a more noble creature than a dog. It could have been a kitten. A kitten, mashallah, innaha min tawafin alaykum wa tawafat. You know, it's an animal that is pure because it comes around in the homes and so on and so forth. And it's a, it's a cleaner, it's a better little, you know, pet, for example. But, rather than it being a bird or a human being or a Muslim or a non-Muslim or anyone else, it is a dog. As Muslims, we know that regarding dogs, there are certain restrictions that are far deeper than a normal animal. What are the restrictions? I'm not allowed to have a dog unless there is a reason. Either security dog, farming dog, or some of a valid reason. For example, a dog to lead a blind person, etc., etc. Some of these rulings, they, they are correct in the Sharia. Some of them, even the normal human beings, the others, they might realize that, you know what? I don't need this and I don't need that. However, when it comes to that dog in particular, we know that even if it licks us, there is a specific way of washing, washing where it licked or the clothing so you know the level of a dog but the hadith says the man saw a dog panting what happened in his heart he felt for the dog listen carefully it's a powerful message it is a powerful message in his heart he felt mercy for the dog and he said لَقَدْ بَلَغَ هَذَا الْكَلْبِ This dog has reached a point of thirst that I had moments ago. Moments ago I was thirsty. This dog is as thirsty as I was. So what did he do? He realized the dog cannot go into the well. So he took his shoe, the same shoe that he drank with. He went back down into the well. He filled it with water. He came all the way up. He got close to the dog. He put his shoe to the mouth of the dog. And the dog drank the water. Allah says, So as a result, we forgave him all his sins. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? He felt for a dog. We have no feelings for other human beings just because they don't share the same faith with us. They are far more noble than dogs because Ashraful Khalqi or Ashraful Makhluqati. Humankind is the most noble of the creation of Allah. Subhanallah. We have no feeling. Is that Islam? Is that your character? Is that your conduct? When if you were to see a dog and it's an authentic narration, 
if you had compassion towards an animal you would achieve something noble what about compassion towards another human being what about compassion towards muslims as well amongst ourselves we hate each other just because of a small difference it doesn't need to get to that level you don't need to become violent you don't need to start blowing up places you don't need to start harming people who are not involved what have they done to you they did nothing to you that's not islam that's not the character of the prophet peace be upon him that's not what he did subhanallah we need to go back to the drawing board and check ourselves check your heart i'm not asking you to compromise your deen never impossible become a better muslim become a person who is more regular with their salah it will show in your character it will show in your character if you are very regular with your salah but your character is evil and your heart is filled with hatred enmity envy jealousy and so on there's something wrong with your intentions, your salah. There's something wrong with it. Go back, for, fix your intention. Do it for the sake of Allah. Try again. Allahu Akbar. One of the signs of closeness to Allah is that you become lenient towards the creatures of the same Allah. Why? Because Allah, whom I'm trying to get close to, is the one who made them for a purpose. Allah made them. Allah created them. Allah created everything. Just like he created you, he created the others. How can you start harming the creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for nothing, no purpose? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. I hope these few words have actually assisted and helped. I read the end of Surah Al-Furqan at the beginning of my talk. I want to give everyone some homework. Please take it seriously. Go home. Pick up the translation of the Quran or on your phones. I'm sure we have an app with the Quran. Can I just see by a show of hands? How many of you have an app with the Quran in it on your phone? Raise your hands high. Subhanallah, almost everyone. Fatahallah alaykum. How many of you make use of it every single day? Put up your hands. Be honest. There we are. 2%, 5%, maybe 10%. I want that to change. Why? We are the ummah of this Quran. I started off at the beginning telling you every verse of it has in it gems, diamonds. We have lessons, we have rules, regulations. This is the word of Allah. It brings about goodness. It calms you down. It is the remembrance of Allah. The best remembrance is to read the Quran. Someone says, do some dhikr. The best dhikr is tilawatul Quran. Read the Quran and try to understand it because a lot of us the problem with us people can con us because we haven't looked at the meanings of the quran so why is islam like this why is islam like that have you ever read the quran have you tried to understand it no we were told it's haram to look at the meaning come on come on someone's trying to pull cotton all over your eyes how can it be you need to study the tafsir of the quran the meanings of the quran properly you need to get the interpretations of it because that is how nobody will be able to fool you thereafter you will know the answers for yourself alhamdulillah my brothers and sisters those verses of surah al-furqan please go through them the last few verses of surah al-furqan where allah describes ibadur rahman the worshippers of the most merciful who are they here are their qualities go and read those qualities and start adopting those qualities start adopting them see it goes as far as how you should walk how you should walk allah is telling you when you walk walk with humility with humbleness no need to be haughty i'm better i'm this i'm no 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 take it easy you are just another human being you are fortunate that you have belief but you are just another human being the day you can say i am better is the day you are given your book in your right hand may allah make us from amongst those so those are the verses i end with again by encouraging you to go through and inshallah to be able to refine your character and conduct the same applies to myself 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. I really enjoyed my time in Kenya. It's a pity we didn't go to Mombasa. Inshallah, the next time we'll add a few more of the places, not just Mombasa as well. And perhaps we'll come back to Nairobi too, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The idea is we all need to help each other to go to Jannah. You make dua for me, pray for me, I pray for you. When we meet each other, we meet each other with the sole purpose of becoming better people so that we can earn paradise. We serve humanity at large for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We serve the rest of the creatures of Allah in the rights that they have over us for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In this way, we will be able to develop ourselves our families, our communities, our nations, the ummah at large, and we will be able to serve the purpose that we are here on earth for, ultimately worshipping Allah alone, following the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Aqulu qawli hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair, brother Mufti Ismail Musa Mank, for those words. If I may just sum up, first, we are reminded of the character of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, that his character was that of the Quran. And we've been given a homework, and inshallah, I stood here today and prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we be among those who hear the good and follow it. So let's all do our homework. Surah Al-Furqan, the last verses of this surah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described the qualities of his servants, and we work, inshallah, towards achieving that. We have nothing to offer you except prayer, brother Mufti. May Allah, inshallah, give you tawfiq in your mission. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as you said, your call is to call people to Jannah, that inshallah, may Allah bring us together in Jannah till Firdaus, where we can sit down and talk of the days when you are here in Nairobi, inshallah. I was whispering to brother, my, my brother here, elder brother Najib Balala, but the Mufti has already given the answer to the people of Mombasa. I was telling Brother Najib Balala yesterday I was being called. And I was being told, tell your elder brother that he owes us. He has a debt. And that he should work with his team to ensure that the Mufti next time is in Mombasa. And I will be happy to host you in my own birthplace Mufti in Mombasa, inshallah. We have a small token for you, Brother Mufti. Not physical, as you say from the Parklands Mosque Committee, which will be, inshallah, given by our Imam Abdul Rahman on behalf of the people of Nairobi and extension by the people of Kenya. Abdul Rahman. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man wala amma ba'd. I would love to take this great opportunity on behalf of Parklands Mosque, the organizers, elite members, and the entire Kenyan ummah as a whole to dedicate some beautiful, wholesome couplets to our beloved visiting prominent scholar, Mufti Ismail Mank. I hope he will accept it from me. These are couplets that echo love and unity. And I have ever loved them since I came across them. I read them and I heard it. They reflect a vibrant meaning of the eye of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dr. Aid al-Qarni. 
may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect him he mentions this couplet in his marvelous book la tahzan don't be sad and he says these couplets are so wholesome that they have been literally engraved on the main entrance of United Nation in the headquarters in the United States of America. So the introductory, introductory lines of his are of such that he says, What will you tell your heart when your heart pays a visit to your other heart, to your beloved? And then he explains the poem and he says, Zarani Mahbubi Fataraka Ali Yalbab. My beloved friend paid me a visit and he gave a knock on my door. And I said from the inside of the house, who is it? He said, Ana Fulan, I am so and so. I said from the inside, La taqul Fulan, don't say Fulan. Qul ana anta wahida. Say that you are me and I am you, so that the entire world can know that we are one and not two. We are telling Mufti Ismail Mank, Antum Nahnu wa Nahnu Antum. These are the couplets he says. Qala lil mahbubu lamma zurtuhu, man bi babi qultu bil babi ana. Qala li akhtaqta ta'rif al-hawa, hina ma farraqta fihi baynana. Wa mada aamun falamma jiktuhu, atruqu al-baba alayhi muhina. Qala li man anta, qultu nzur fama. ثم إلا أنت بالباب هنا قال لي أحسنت تعريف الهوى وعرفت الحب فدخل يا أنا the ones who understand Arabic will appreciate this couplet and definitely the one whom they are dedicated to that's Mufti Ismail and he has definitely understood it and I finish by saying دخلتم قلوبنا قبل أن تدخلوا أبوابنا وجزاكم الله خيرا Truly, you have entered our hearts even before you entered our door. Jazakallahu khair. And now it's my pleasure to request our elder brother, Honorable Najib Balala, to give a word of thanks on behalf of each and every person who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given tawfiq for this to be possible. And we are saying, Brother Mufti, we know you travel a lot, but this is your second home after Harare. You are most uh, welcome, and inshallah, it will be our honor to host you again. May Allah give tawfiq in your words. And after Brother Najib speaks, inshallah, we'll allow the Mufti to leave, and I will, inshallah, give direction as to how we live safely, inshallah, this whole. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My brothers and sisters, our chief guest, who is uh, Mufti Mank, I'm humbled to stand here today on behalf of the organizing committee, which I want to mention the journey of faith led by Ismail, Abdi Ismail and Khidr and the other team, and also Parkland's Mosque, uh, headed by Brother Fawz Quraysh, al Ganatra, and the others, and Shamil, who has been a very key driver to this event, my brother Shamil, as well as the Kenya Arab Friendship Society with the whole management committee. I want also to, to mention our colleagues and brothers from Jamia Mosque and other Islamic organizations in Nairobi who have co collaborated with us to make this event successful. Alhamdulillah, it has worked well. And truly, Mufti, you have entered into our hearts before even entering into our homes. I know I owe the people of Mombasa for you not going there, but you promised me in the near future we will visit there. We have the Senator of Mombasa, Honorable Hassan Omar is here, so please, take the message to the people of Mombasa and, uh, and assure them we will come and visit not only with Mufti Meng but also with the team that is coming in April from the journey of faith so we can share these highly known scholars to part with knowledge that will always change our way of life and to be firm 
and understand our religion even much better, rather of mis misguided a few by exhorting different ways of our religion. But mine is to say thank you to all of you who have made this event successful. As I said yesterday, when I used to come, when I used to be a politician, I used to come here. And when I come here, through political parties or election counting, is always division, divisions and divisive. But today and yesterday I entered this hall and we saw the unity of purpose that brought us here as united Muslim community in this country. I was very touched to see that we still are united and we are doing what is good and contributed to the betterment of our community, our religion and our country. And I want to congratulate all of you and also thank you for making this event successful. It hasn't been easy to organize such an event, but we tried our best and definitely we must have shortcomings and we accept those shortcomings. But more important thing, you collaborated and wanted to attend this event through the registration process. As I said yesterday, registration was so quick to fill. Even last night, when we opened for an additional 500 more people to come in today, it was within one hour, it was already full. So that is the commitment we have seen. And also, you have seen the crowd here. Majority are our sisters and mothers, and the female who have decided to be the majority today. But me, it consoles me, because then our homes and our families is solidly behind our religion and our faith. So I want to thank you all. I thank all of you. I thank the organizers, all my brothers who have organized, and my sisters who have been in this organizing committee. Uh, thank you very much for organizing. But more important, our scholar, we are very proud of you. I remember the first time you came, four years ago, when you opened our mosque in Halinga, Masjid al Rahma. And today you are back here. And as you promised, you'll be back again. We are not going to be Harare, and we don't have the Ferrari, but I can tell you, we have our hearts to share with you, and we are willing to make this deen a better deen. Thank you. Jazakumullah khair.